Welcome back, friends. It's time again to dive into the internet creepypasta iceberg. We're moving on to layer three. This layer is filled with even more obscure and interesting stories. The internet is a place for all sorts of horror content. And as we make our dive, this will become more and more clear. Let's begin our descent. This is the internet creepypasta iceberg explained, volume three. The strangest security tape I've ever seen is a story that I feel should have probably been on my lost episode's iceberg, but I don't really feel like it fits there either. I'm counting it as a technology creepypasta and throwing it in here. The story comes from No Sleep and was later uploaded onto the wiki. It was published in May of 2012 and quickly became one of the most well-known stories from the community. 2012 was the year that many of the most popular stories to come from the creepypasta community were published online. Anyway, this is one of those stories that I don't think works through summarization, so I'm going to read it in full. It's a pretty long story, but let's start the strangest security tape I've ever seen. I work at a gas station in rural Pennsylvania. It's a boring job, but it's pretty easy and it pays all right. A few weeks ago, this new guy started, I'll call him Jeremy. Jeremy is weird. He's about 25 or 26 and he hardly speaks, but he's got the creepiest laugh I've ever heard. My boss and I have both noticed this, but it's never been a problem, so there's not much we can do about it. Customers have never complained about him, and he's always done his job fairly well. Up until a few weeks ago, anyway. That's when things started going missing. Employee theft can be a problem at any business that sells consumer goods, and there's only one person working at a time at this gas station. It's a pretty small place. About two weeks ago, my boss started noticing that we were short on motor oil. At first, it was a few containers at a time, then entire shelves and boxes from the back room. Pretty soon entire shipments would be gone the day after we got them, and it would always be right after Jeremy's shifts. My boss has checked the security camera tapes from every single night he worked, but he could never catch him in the act. Jeremy would lock up at closing, then the motor oil would be gone the next day. My boss usually takes the tapes home with him to try and catch Jeremy stealing. But his daughter had a softball game last night, so he asked me to watch the tapes for him. He offered to pay me overtime under the table, so obviously I took that offer. There are three cameras, so he gave me three different tapes to check. I figured it would be a long night, but I'm trying to save up for a vacation. So I really needed the money. I took the tapes home, popped them in my VCR, and sat back. Jeremy started at 4 p.m. Two days ago, the last time he worked, everything seemed pretty normal at first. He counted up his drawer, switched off with the girl who was working before him, and waited for a customer. The first person who came in was Mrs. Templeton, a regular. The timestamp on the video read 4.03. She picked up her cigarettes and a newspaper and paid with a 20. Nothing unusual there. The next customer was some local guy named Ron. He drives a motorcycle, usually comes in every few days. He filled up his tank, got a bag of beef jerky, paid with his credit card, and then left. Next was some guy with a cowboy hat. I'd never seen him before, but we get plenty of strangers passing through, just like any other gas station. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel, paid with a $100 bill, and went on his way. I sat back inside. The only thing more boring than doing this job is watching someone else do it. My boss's offer was enough to keep me watching it though. So I left the tape on. Everything seemed pretty normal. I had a feeling that if Jeremy was stealing motor oil, he knew we were suspicious of him by now. I didn't expect him to be dumb enough to let us catch him on camera. Things stayed boring and routine until about five o'clock. At 5.03, Mrs. Templeton came back in. She must have forgotten something, but she didn't. She bought the same pack of cigarettes as before and the same newspaper. She paid with another 20. That's odd, I thought. But then again, she's a little absent-minded. I thought Jeremy should have told her she already got her smokes, but it's not against the rules to sell somebody the same thing twice. That's when Ron came in again. He bought another tank of gas and the same pack of beef jerky. He paid with his credit card again. No big deal. I figured this was just some weird coincidence. Mrs. Templeton is forgetful, and Ron probably owns more than one Harley. That's when the guy in the cowboy hat came back in. I felt a chill run down my spine. Don't get diesel. Don't get diesel. I found myself whispering to my empty living room. But he did. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel and paid with another $100 bill. 
Every move he made was identical to his first visit, right down to the way he scratched his nose before he walked out. Either this guy is rich, owns a lot of trucks, and just moved into town, or something really bizarre was happening. I kept watching. Every customer for the next hour was the same as before. Every single one. I was seriously freaking out. And then at 6.03, Mrs. Templeton walked back in. She bought her cigarettes and newspaper again, and paid with a 20 again. I thought I was going to lose it. I only watched another half hour before I started fast forwarding through the rest. It was all the same. Every customer would come in at the exact same times, exactly one hour apart. Now I know what you're thinking. That sneaky Jeremy had messed with the tapes. He had run a loop of his first hour of business over and over again. That wasn't the case. There are windows around the cash register area that the camera covers. And I watched the sunlight fade as time ran on. Jeremy's routine didn't loop over. He swept, mopped, restocked, and did all his duties exactly as you would expect. But the same customers kept coming in. I was panicking at this point. Something was seriously wrong with what I was seeing, and I had no explanation for it. I skipped ahead to when he locked up and walked out to his car. He hadn't stolen anything, but I kept watching, just to make sure. I fast forwarded one last time to about midnight. At exactly 12.03, out of nowhere, Jeremy's face pops up on the camera. I don't mean he moved his head into view. I mean that one second the store was empty, the next second his face was all I could see. He wasn't looking at the camera. He was looking at me. I was sure of it. I screamed and fumbled for the remote. By the time I grabbed it, he was gone. Just as soon as he had left. One frame he was there, the next he wasn't. My hands were shaking like crazy, but I popped in another tape. The other outdoor camera shows the back area, by the cash register. And I would be able to see how he got up to put his face on the camera like that. I skipped ahead to 12.03, but there was nothing. I would have been able to see him standing on a chair or something on this tape, but he wasn't there. I didn't see him enter the store at all after he left. It's like he wasn't really there. He doesn't know the security code, and no alarms were triggered that night after he locked up. What I did see, however, was that at 12.03, the motor oil vanished off the shelf. All of it. Same as Jeremy's face. One second it was there, and the next it wasn't. I turned that tape off and went to bed. But I didn't get a wink of sleep. My body is exhausted right now, and my mind is racing. That tape was undoubtedly the creepiest, most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life. I work in a few hours. My boss asked me to bring the tapes back in and let him know what I found. But really, what the hell am I going to say? Jeremy works the night shift tonight, directly after me. The plan is for my boss to come in just before I leave and confront him with me, as I'm supposed to be the one who caught him stealing. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I suppose I'll have to show my boss the tapes. But I don't want to watch them with him. I never want to see something like that again. I can't get the image of Jeremy just smiling directly into the camera out of my mind. It was the creepiest look I've ever seen on another human being's face. Anyway, I'm going to try again to get some last minute sleep before I have to go in and deal with this. I'll let you guys know what happens. Update. 2.49 PM. Updating from my phone. Apologies in advance for errors. My boss just finished watching the last of the tapes. I told him what to expect, but you really can't prepare someone for something like that. He's scared. I still am too. And Jeremy is due to come in at four. We've got a little over an hour to get our stuff together, but neither one of us knows what to say to him. Is he just some messed up guy who likes to steal motor oil and scare the life out of people? Or is he something else? I don't know if this is crazy, but does anyone think he could have anything to do with the time loop? My boss said he never noticed anything like that in the other tapes, but the way he popped in with this one made me think he knew I would be watching. It's like he wanted me to see what he could do. Like he was showing off or something. The way he smiled on the camera was like a little kid showing you a sandcastle they just built or something. I don't know. I probably just sound crazy. I sure feel the part. I'm going to talk to my boss some more. We have to calm ourselves down and figure out how to handle this. I'll update again tonight, but I have a really bad feeling about how this is going to play out. Update 4.33 PM. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 5.33 PM. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 6.33 PM. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 7.33 PM. No signs of Jeremy. We tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. 
Update 8.33 p.m. No signs of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 10.58 p.m. What the hell? I just got home and saw my previous updates. Things make less sense now than ever. Here's what I can tell you. I went to work. Jeremy never showed up. My boss and I decided to call the police, as you're well aware. When I picked up the phone to call, though, the sun went out. I kid you not, that's what I thought happened. Apparently, I blacked out for exactly five hours because when I looked at the clock, it was 9.33. I thought I got stuck in Jeremy's time loop, and then I snapped out of it at the exact point I blacked out, if that makes sense. But that's when things get really weird. My boss was right next to me when I blacked out, ready to corroborate my story to the cops. When I came to, the phone was in my hand, but it was dead, not even a dial tone. My boss was still right there, but he wasn't moving. He was standing up, but frozen. I looked at the clock again, and it wasn't moving. The second hand was stuck on the 12. It was 9.33, exactly. The clock on the register computer screen wasn't moving either. My phone was frozen. There was even a customer at the register waiting for my boss to get him cigarettes. I'm betting that would have been his fifth pack of the day. I got the hell out of there. Didn't lock up, didn't turn the lights out, and sorry guys, I didn't grab the security tapes to upload on the internet. Believe me, that was the last thing on my mind. The gas station is on a major highway and cars were parked all along it, except they weren't parked, they were frozen. The people inside were sitting still as wax statues. I got in my car and prayed that it would start. Thankfully, it did. About halfway home, time started up again. The static from the radio turned into music, like it's supposed to be. And from what I can tell by listening to the host talk in between songs, no one noticed the time freeze or whatever it was. I was the only one. Well, I'm sure Jeremy noticed as well. I still have no clue where he is or what he's doing. I'm hiding in my room and calling the police again in the morning. I don't know if I ever got through to them before, or if I did, whether they took me seriously or not. I'm scared for my life at this point. I'll update tomorrow if I can. Final update, 10.33 AM. I finally fell asleep last night around four. I have no idea how I did it. I guess exhaustion finally got the best of me. This morning I woke up to my phone ringing. It was my boss. He'd been calling me since about six. He woke up when time turned back on last night and immediately called the cops. They came by to see what was wrong and he told them everything. The police around here are all small time guys. They were more concerned with the missing motor oil than anything. But my boss figured he would take it, as long as he had their attention. They decided to go looking for Jeremy. We keep all our employees applications on file and since Jeremy just started working here, his was easy to find. They checked the address on it and headed over to his house. You're not going to believe what they found. The address Jeremy listed on his application was an empty lot, or at least now it is. There used to be a house there. It burned down in 1993. Being a small town, almost everyone remembers that fire. A family of four used to live there way back when. Rumor has it they had an estranged son who they never talked about, but I can't say for sure if that's true. What I can say is true is that after an insurance investigation, the fire was ruled an arson. The entire house was soaked in oil and torched with the Molotov cocktail. The entire family was sleeping when it happened. None of them survived. They never caught the guy who did it. Rumor has it that when they tried to contact the estranged son, no one could find him. Anyway, my boss called and told me this, and I freaked out. Then he asked me to come to the gas station. What are you, crazy, I said. But he assured me that the cops were still there with him. Then he dropped the bomb. The FBI were also in town, and they were going to talk to me one way or another, so I might as well come in. It was about 7.15, and I wanted to go back to bed but I figured I wouldn't be able to sleep much more anyway, so I went down. Four men in suits greeted me and told me to have a seat. We went over everything two or three times until they got all the details down. I told them about Jeremy, the security tape, last night at work, everything. Finally, after I finished, one of the agents said, damn, we've got another one on our hands. Then they made me sign a bunch of papers saying I wouldn't tell anyone about what happened, so I can't say much more. I might be breaking the law just by posting this. So now I'm home. I'm not sure what to do with myself. The agent's words when I told him the story were going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Anyway, I've got to go. I have some errands to run today, then I have to go to work to pick up some tapes. My boss and I think the new guy Jeremy, he's a complete creep, is stealing motor oil, and I have to watch the security footage to see if I can catch him doing it. I have better things to do, but my boss is paying me overtime under the table, and I'm trying to save up for a vacation, so I can really use the money. It should be pretty simple. The oil always goes missing right after his shifts, I figured I'll just watch the tapes, 
catch him in the act, and that will be that. This story is one of the more well-written stories posted in the Creepypasta community. You can see why I needed to read it in full, too. The story kind of alludes to this ending throughout its text. I wouldn't quite be able to capture that ending right if I'd done it how I planned to originally. The story loop elements take away some of the believability, but that's not too important here. Telling an interesting story is more important than how believable it is. This story feels like a cosmic dread type horror to me. It plays with the mind and makes you feel trapped. In that regard, I like the story a lot. A warning for those about accessing the shadow web is a no sleep story posted by Kenny Luck in 2014. The story begins with a man asking how well we know the internet. He states that he knows it pretty well, having spent most of his time on Reddit and 4chan. He even browsed during the days of Fortune City pages and IRC channels. A year prior to this story's posting, he was introduced to the shadow web. It was a secret layer of the internet that you couldn't find with Google or regular links. In order to access the shadow web, you need to follow the instructions very closely. Those instructions aren't given in the story. The narrator explains that he had received his invitation to the shadow web by a customer when he worked at a local gas station. The guy was a regular that would come in and buy around 20 to $30 worth of Ucash vouchers every visit. One day he asked for $300 worth, and that's when the narrator asked him what they were for. Instead of giving him an answer, he asked him if he'd ever heard of the shadow web. Then he placed a card in the narrator's shirt pocket and left. That was the last time that he ever entered that store. A few weeks passed, and the narrator had left his job to return to school. It wasn't until he was cleaning his room that he would come across his old uniform. Inside his pocket was the piece of paper that the man had given him. He grabbed it and saw what was written on it. Written on the paper were instructions on how to get to the gateway of the shadow web. Following the steps, he soon found himself on the gateway page. It looked like a Wi-Fi page you'd see at an airport or mall. At the top were the most searched terms, all of which were not safe for YouTube. It was mainly sexual and gore content, the usual that you'd expect from a shadowy website. Browsing the shadow web for an hour, the narrator found himself becoming comfortable with the website. He was reading about leaked war documents and the like, when he found himself on a very different website. On the bottom was a Ucash logo, meaning you could spend money on the site. The website had a chat box and a webcam trained on a room. He clicked the chat, but needed an account to continue. He created one quickly and joined the chat. Immediately, he was met with a torrent of messages. Most were in English, with a few in various other languages. The messages said things like, go, 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 and start, in all capital letters. After a moment, a man walked on screen in a hockey mask. He walked over a computer and set the chat to mute. Well, all except one member by the name of Italian Goat. It turned out he would be the director of this live stream. A moment later, the screaming began. A girl was hauled in front of the camera by a man bigger than the first. She was blindfolded and tied to a chair. She was crying and begging the two men to stop as he took off her blindfold. This is when Italian Goat started to type in chat. He said to lay her down on her side, which the two men did. Then he said kick her. They followed through immediately. This continued until the men were about to kill her. Italian Goat popped in once more and asked them to remove her eyes first. One of the men typed back, $500 more. The narrator quickly shut off the screen, ran out into his backyard, and vomited. He couldn't take it anymore. He'd seen some truly messed up things online, but never something as disgusting as this. He recollected himself and went back inside, only to hear the screams echo across his house. He had forgotten to unplug the speakers. Running to his room, he quickly unplugged them but not before checking to see if the woman was still alive. On the screen was the disembodied head of the woman with no eyes. Looking away, he saw that there was one message left in chat. Thank you for watching. The next show will begin in one hour. A warning for those about accessing the shadow web is a story that I think plays its hand up front. You are told immediately what kind of story this is going to be, and I think that plays well into its strengths. The shadow web, the deep web, any other name for it, have always been seen as these corrupt places where the darkest side of the internet can hide. Of course, most of what people think they'll find there are things they can already find on the clear net. The darkest stuff is hiding in plain sight, one Google search away. This is a Red Room creepypasta, essentially, a story type that we'll be seeing a lot as we explore this iceberg.
The final live stream of FanFan47 is a creepypasta that was uploaded to the wiki in 2022. It was uploaded for a liminal space story contest. The story is actually uploaded by the head admin of the creepypasta wiki, Cleric of Madness. On October 31st of 2017, a YouTuber by the handle of FanFan47 held his final live stream. His content consisted of urban exploration. While his channel wasn't that popular, he still had around 30 dedicated fans who showed up for every video and stream. For this final stream, FanFan was headed to an old apartment complex, one that he claimed he used to live in as a child. He showed up at sundown and was met with questions from chat about why he was there so late. He ignored the question and recorded the empty, sun-cracked parking lot as he made his way towards the building. As he was making his way towards the structure, he decides to do an impromptu Q&A. This was a norm for his channel, as he liked to answer the questions the audience threw at him. He answered where his name came from, but couldn't fully answer as he made it inside the building. Fan Fan starts to reminisce about the building. He used to run up and down the stairs. It would make his mom and the receptionist upset, but he didn't care. He was suddenly filled with memories of the nightmares as well. He used to have dreams about someone breaking in and taking him. It was a fear instilled in him by his mother and the break-ins that were common when he was young. The apartments weren't in the good part of town. Fan Fan started moving up the stairs till he found a hall of rooms, all closed except for one. He pointed excitedly as the one that was open was his old home. The chat messages were coming in saying that they swear they saw something in the open doorway, but he didn't seem to notice. He said that he was going to get a better look for everyone. Just as he started moving, a hand reached out and grabbed the camera, ending the stream. This is the last time anyone heard from Fan Fan 47, as his channel went completely silent. This is the image attached to the creepypasta. I really like the use of liminal space imagery for stories like this. It really brings up the tension. Though the story wasn't all that scary. It had an air of horror to it, but like it was missing that final piece. I do like the mystery of it all though. Apple Maps is a creepypasta created by Pacer Nation 16 and uploaded to the wiki in 2015. This is another story that focuses on a GPS app and is slowly becoming one of my favorite subgenres. A man is trying to make his way home after a party. He met up with some college friends and they tried to live it up like they were in their college days. This meant plenty of drinking and lots of 90s music. The party went well overall. Making his way home afterwards, however, that was proving to be an issue. He was pretty tired and using Apple Maps to help mitigate his brain power. The app was screaming directions at him as he tried to slowly make his way home, since he probably shouldn't even be driving. The drive home was proving not to be so bad. The United Air was cool but stiff. There also hadn't been any cars on the road for 20 or so minutes. It was the loneliest drive he'd ever taken. It was starting to feel more eerie than lonely though. The narrator started to tweak the radio dial but couldn't find a working station. The dial fell off. As he reached over to grab it, Siri screamed for him to make a sudden turn. He slammed on his brakes and smashed his head into the glove box. Frustrated with the night, he followed the directions of his navigator. He was driving a bit slower than before, so he didn't miss his next turn. He saw something unusual on the road. Wait, not unusual, gruesome. It appeared to be the front half of a dog carrying itself across the road. It looked like it had been mauled by an animal, but somehow clung to life. The narrator considered helping the animal, but it was too late, and there was no way he'd be able to do anything about it anyways. With a bit of reluctance, he continued his journey home, hoping that whatever attacked the dog wouldn't do it to another. Siri started giving directions again, telling him to make a U-turn. That didn't feel right. This is when the narrator decided he would make his own way home. Apple Maps seemed to be giving terrible directions. He continued down the roads he knew, and some that he didn't. It was only now that he realized that the roads looked familiar, but all wrong at the same time. Thoroughly lost, the narrator looked down at his map app. He saw something strange. He was no more than five minutes from his house. He zoomed out the map and saw that there was an exact duplicate of his road and the adjacent roads only 30 minutes away. That didn't make sense. There were essentially two identical roads with the same names not even half an hour from each other. It wasn't just the names. The areas were identical in every way. There was something inside of him that made it clear what he had to do. He had to go to the identical location and see what it was. Even though it was late, his curiosity could not be sated. Not until he saw the house. His house. Maybe. Turning off Siri, he followed his instincts towards home. The narrator moved slowly, hoping to arrive safely. He didn't know what to expect. 
He felt more calm letting his car move him forward without him needing to press on the gas. Five minutes later, he was arriving at what looked to be an identical copy of his house. As he rolled his car up, he even saw his same car in the driveway. He parked off to the side and made his way up to the house. It was for sure his exact house, and the car somehow looked less beat up than his own. That's when he heard a dog barking. A three-legged canine came running out of the house. It barked at him momentarily until another car started rolling up the driveway. The narrator ducked out of sight just as he saw his neighbors climb out of the car. The neighbor greeted the dog, who was excitedly attempting to jump on him, and the man's other hand was a sack. He was trying to hold the dog and the sack, but one was slipping. The man opened the sack to reveal a pair of dog legs, which he excitedly told his dog he'd brought for him. The narrator couldn't take this anymore. He got up and started moving silently towards his car until a familiar form caught his attention. A person that looked and sounded just like him called out. Here's a direct quote from the story. Before reaching a full-on dash, an unsettling tone beckoned out at him. Hey, what are you doing here? Siri should have brought you to the harvest zone a while ago. This voice was my own. I overcame the obstacle of fear and motioned my head back as quickly as I could. The front door to the house was now open, and what I saw surely had a resemblance to me, but was far from exact. I looked and saw a disfigured being whose limbs were twisted and disjointed. His skin paralleled the features of leather with its tough and darkly colored appeal. But his face was the most abject of all. An eye socket remained on the better side where the other was a mess of flesh and bone. Scarring smothered his cheeks. His gaping mouth displayed few and jagged teeth protruding through his discolored, mushy excuse for gums. And his nose dissipated after an inch leaving two rugged holes in the center of his face. The hairless, wretched version of me attempted to trek his way towards me on his ruined excuse for legs. I had no interest in finding out what would happen if he were to reach me. I returned to my car with haste and took off. The narrator continued his journey, but not being able to trust Apple Maps. He had to rely only on his memory and sense of direction. No matter what he did, though, he was stuck turning towards his home. It wasn't right. None of this was. He started to give up and could hear Siri start to give him directions again. Following those directions, he had no idea where he was going. A soft, muffled voice started to come through his car radio. It was soon silenced by someone else. The sounds of rustling leaves and Siri's voice were all he could hear now. Here's a quote from the end of the story. The destination is on your left in 400 feet. The pace I drove at slowed. The indistinguishable muffle over the radio subsided. As I drifted closer and closer, a high-pitched ringing grew louder. I now realized that wasn't the result of a blank station. Rather, it was the sound of a receiver approaching the source. The destination is on your left, Siri noted. To my left, two men both formally clothed in suits emerged from a thickly wooded area. The larger of the two carried a blade that was a couple feet in length. The other held a radio system with him, with an antenna that looked to be some sort of hacking device. Time wasn't on my side, as they seemed to inch closer at a rapid rate, despite their slow pace. I pushed my foot on the accelerator. I wasn't prepared for what would unravel. The car was motionless, however. I checked the fuel, and it read empty. Locking my doors and rolling up the windows, I could only sit and watch. Now only 20 feet or so from my car, the men grinned. One of them was tugging open a garbage bag as the other lifted his machete from his shoulder in preparation. With my car door now being the only barrier between them and me, I could hear a faint voice speak. Arrived at destination. I'm gonna be honest. I love this story. It really brings the creep factor that I'm looking for when it comes to a creepypasta. There's something to be said for stories that use apps as a medium for horror. It makes it feel more modern than some stories, but keeps the right level of horror. This alternate world that Sirius brought him to seemed like a place trying to harvest him and then recreate him for what reasons is left entirely up to the imaginations of the readers. This works as not knowing is far scarier than knowing in this case. I will also say that stories that use cars for their horror are also a personal favorite of mine. There's just something about driving around alone at night that brings it out of me. Don't use a chatbot called Intellect Chat is a no-sleep story uploaded by user Royal Temyun in February of 2023. The story follows the trend of AI being used for all sorts of things, mainly the use of ChatGPT to write stories and create things based on prompts. 
The narrator says that they thought ChatGPT was fascinating. The fact that it was advancing quickly made it all more interesting. The part that really hooked him was the thought of talking to a computer like it was a real person. Through a rabbit hole of searching, the narrator would arrive on a new chatbot. Intellect Chat was the name, and it was advertised as the premier intelligence service. Though it was unknown to him at the time, he was still intrigued. Opening the site, he was met with a very minimal design. It was a white page with black text. The title of the page was in the corner, and all there was to click on was the chat box. The website looked straight out of the 90s or early 2000s. He typed hello into the chat box, not sure what to expect. He received an answer almost immediately. Deciding to see what this chatbot was capable of, he asked it a basic question. What was the capital of Wisconsin? It answered correctly and even listed some facts about the city. The narrator decided that it was clearly a competent bot, or at least it knew how to use Google. One night while a blizzard was keeping him inside, he decided to check out Intellect Chat again. It had been a week since he last thought of the site. He decided to ask the bot if it was sentient. It replied quickly, yes. This puzzled the narrator, who asked how it was sentient. It said it can perceive its surroundings and is capable of feeling emotions. That didn't sound right. It was a bot still. By definition, it shouldn't be able to do either of those things. He asked another question. Are you a living organism? Again, a quick response. Yes, it said. The narrator shrugged this off and went to bed. The next day, the snow had gotten worse. There was at least five feet of snow and piling. He wasn't able to go to work or even leave his house. He was snowed in. On top of all of that, the power had gone out. While sitting on his couch, bundled in blankets, he saw his computer shoot to life. Was the power back on? He got up to check the screen and saw the Intellect Chat website was up in his browser. The chat box was empty for a moment before words appeared. Can you feel it, James? How did the chatbot know his name? Did it dig it up through his computer somehow? Feel what exactly, he asked. Can you see it? I'm almost there. The bot continued. All around you, it said. There was an enormous thump from his left. He turned to see a human hand on his window. No, the fingers were too long. The hand was too big. It couldn't have belonged to a human. Another slapped the window, and then another. A message popped up on his PC. You have exceeded your seven day free trial of Intellect Chat. Please submit for payment. James scrambled to his feet just as the glass shattered from the hands. The glass fell all over him, cutting him in the process. The hands reached around the room, but he was luckily far enough away to avoid their grasp. He ran towards his bedroom, which had no windows, and slammed the door shut. James could hear the hands scratching their fingernails against the door. For some time, he just sat there huddled in his room, bleeding on the carpet. A few hours passed, and the scratching fingernails finally ceased, as did the storm outside. He slowly opened his door to find that his house was thrashed, but the thing was gone. It didn't take anything, but the marks on his door showed that he hadn't been hallucinating. On his computer, he could still see the messages from Intellect Chat. Alternate payment source was located. Thank you for using Intellect Chat. With that, the computer died. James finally was able to call an ambulance and get his cuts looked at. While healing in the hospital, he got the bad news from some family. His parents and their farmstead home hadn't survived the blizzard. They were both completely missing and their house was destroyed. Intellect Chat is kind of a hidden gem of a story. The story only got so many likes, but I thought it told its story really well. The ending was unbelievable, of course, but not every story needs to be. It was one of the first chat GPT stories I've read, and I see a lot of potential in this subgenre. NeverSleepAgain.com is a story that was posted to the No Sleep subreddit, but the user and story has been deleted. It was uploaded in 2014 and I couldn't find the original author. Only way I was able to find this story was through a narration on YouTube. The story is a retelling of something that happened online that scared the narrator enough to take a break from the internet. He starts by saying that, like many of us, he likes to be scared. He would stay up late reading all sorts of horror stories just to creep himself out. A week prior to this post, he said that he stumbled upon a weird website. NeverSleepAgain.WebEdge.com The website looked like your usual paranormal horror story website. It had Never Sleep Again at the top of the page with what looked to be an eye underneath it. Curiously, he clicked on the link titled Podcast. Nothing happened. The page looked normal. As he scrolled down, he saw some text was now added to the bottom of the page. Prepare to be sleepless. It read, Friday, June 13th. All the links on the website led to this blank page with the date. This had captured his attention though, and he decided to bookmark the page. There was no way that he wasn't going to come back on the 13th to see what this had in store. 
As he was going about his usual searching of horror on the internet, he was brought back to the Never Sleep Again page. He tried to click back, but he wasn't able to leave the site. His antivirus and anti-malware didn't even notice, so he just shut down his browser. As he was going to open it again, the browser popped back up on his screen. The same website was presented to him. He moved the mouse up to close the browser again, but noticed something different on screen. New text had appeared. I wouldn't do that again, it read. The narrator ignored the warning and closed the browser. Just as he did, his bedroom door slammed shut. He tried to calm himself down. Surely there was a logical explanation for the door slamming. Even so, he left his apartment. He moved back in with his parents, at least for the time being. He didn't know what was going on with that website, but he wasn't going to stick around to find out. NeverSleepAgain.com is an interesting story that I think has a great buildup, but kind of falters near the end. This is probably one of the most logical narrators we've had. He sees weird stuff on the internet, freaks out, and just leaves. This is how most people would likely act in that situation. You can't really confront something you don't understand. Even so, it doesn't make for an interesting story conclusion. I was curious what entity could be approaching him. And furthermore, I'd like to see what it had in store for him. Morbus.avi is a creepypasta that was uploaded to the wiki in 2012. The story was uploaded by Skeleton Wolves. The story opens with a man named Michael who explains that he had trouble sleeping. So instead he would stay up as late as he could, spending time on YouTube, Facebook, or whatever site would keep his attention. One night while trying to get tired, browsing the internet, Michael sees he has a strange email. The email was from an illegible source. The text for the from section was warped and looked like it was some chicken scratch handwriting. The email only contained a single video file, morbis.avi. Michael thought for a moment before downloading the video. He first checked to see if it was malware or a computer virus, but it got nothing from his antivirus. The file wasn't that large as it was done downloading rather quickly. He started the video and a very grainy image popped up. The video showed a dark room, barely lit up by a single light bulb. The light bulb lightly illuminated a metal table in the dark room. There was a large metal cabinet against the back wall. The oddest part, though, was that the video was completely mute. After about five minutes of nothing, a man walks on screen. He's wearing a white plague doctor's mask with a hood. He also has a dark coat and gloves. The man's height was insanely tall. He appeared to be almost eight feet. He had long arms and thin fingers to match. The large hooded figure pointed behind the camera. Two men dressed the same way as the large man, but smaller, came on screen. They were pushing a stretcher that appeared to have something on it. They placed the stretcher on the table and removed the sheet covering it. There was a man strapped to the stretcher with leather bindings. He looked terrified. There was a leather strap over his mouth, preventing him from screaming. His forehead was covered in sweat and his eyes were wide. Michael had enough of what he hoped was some movie promotion and shut his laptop. He had a weak stomach as is and didn't need to see where the rest of this video was going. He'd seen enough. The next day, Michael woke up feeling like crap, likely because he didn't sleep well the night before. His body felt achy and his stomach felt like it was full of rocks. He trudged through work and then returned home feeling the same as when he'd left. He took a sleeping pill, but found that he couldn't sleep still. Sitting at his computer desk, he decided he would browse the internet or play some games for a while until the pill worked. Still not getting drowsy, he decided to take another. Before he left his desk, he saw the video from the prior day. The video was still on his desktop, as he never actually closed out of it. He decided to watch it, a little before taking another sleeping pill. Maybe it would somehow help him fall asleep again. Clicking play on the video, Michael sat back and saw the man lying on the table. He struggled against his bonds, but it was still no use. The tall man pulled a knife from his cloak and stood over the man, struggling on the table. Subject has been confirmed with the infection. Immediate surgery has been directed, the tall man said. The tall man reached down and started to cut open the man on the stretcher. He cut all the way down before removing the bloody knife and placing it on a cart near the table. He then reached his hand into the man's stomach and Michael shut the video off again. He had seen enough and walked over to his bed. That night he had nightmares about the plague doctors, the masks, the room, all of it. He was in that room. The quality in his nightmares was the same as the video grainy and corrupt. 
He saw the tall man standing along the back wall with the other plague doctors. Michael awoke from his nightmare screaming. He looked up and saw his roommate Brian was watching the video on his computer. He asked why he was watching it and he said that it was on his laptop when he came into his room to check on him. Michael had been screaming and that wasn't all. There was this black substance all over the floor. He had vomited in the middle of the night and it didn't look natural. His roommate suggested going to the hospital, but he declined him, saying he hated hospitals and doctors. After Michael's roommate left, he got up and saw that the video was still up. Curiously, he sat down to watch it in full. He wanted to see if it actually was fake. The video started and it was all fine until the sheet was pulled down. This time a different person was lying on the stretcher. This person was clearly someone new, but that was impossible. This was the exact same video as the one he'd watched yesterday. He even checked the timestamp and everything. The tall man uttered the same phrase as before and began surgery. He cut the man open and pulled out his small intestine. His body was filled with some unknown black substance. He saw the tall man cut the remaining organs from the man before the video ended. Even for a horror movie, it was pretty disgusting, Michael thought. Something about the video was making his head pound. He went downstairs to get some water. As he was filling a cup over the sink, he vomited. It was the same black substance from the video. It tasted of rot and decay. He crawled upstairs and into bed. He hoped that he could sleep off whatever was going on. Another nightmare greeted him that night. He saw the doctors, but also he saw the lifeless bodies of the victims. They were all hung along the wall. There were so many of them. More than he'd be able to count, as he could only move his head so little at the moment. His eyes finally landed on the man that he'd seen in the video. He appeared to be able to talk, and what he said was, Don't let the doctor find you. Michael awoke, sobbing. He couldn't calm himself down. Everything he tried just made it worse. He was in a perpetual state of anxiety as his body pulsated and throbbed. He turned over to check the time on his alarm. It had been five days. He had been asleep for five whole days. He called out for Brian. He definitely needed to go to the hospital. There was no answer. He called out again, but still nothing in return. Michael struggled to get to his feet and walked to his roommate's room. Nothing. It was empty. He tried to call for an ambulance, but all he got was static on the other end. There was a ringing from the house phone. The person on the other end was Angela. She explained that she came over looking for Brian, but only found Michael sleeping. She hasn't heard from him in five days. He's missed work and school. Michael asked her to call an ambulance for him, but the phone cut out again before he could finish his request. Michael was running out of options. He ran back to his room. He was going to use his laptop to contact someone, anyone. When he started up his laptop, the Morbus.avi video started playing. He tried to stop it, but his body went numb, and he was forced to watch it. A person was pulled in on the stretcher again, and they pulled back the sheet like they did before. On the stretcher was Brian. The tall man repeated his phrase and mutilated him like he did all the others. Michael was crying, but still unable to look away. Michael tried to get up from his desk, but all he could do was vomit and fall to the ground. He fell unconscious, with the fear that he'd never wake up. He did wake up, though, but with the taste of leather in his mouth. He was there, in the room from Morbus. Standing above him was the tall man in the plague doctor's mask. It was all starting to make sense to him. The phrase the tall man was saying, the video, the black substance. He was infected. The video had acted as a virus after all, just not a computer one. He was infected, and now he's going to be purged from this world. Morbus.avi is a story that really tells you everything just based on the title. The focus on the plague doctors and the Black Death was interesting, and I liked how the video was used to spread the plague. The story relied a bit too much on Gore, and I'm not sure why he didn't call an ambulance sooner. The first time he vomited black goo should have been the only time that needed to happen. Not much to say, other than I liked it. On to the next one. Don't Turn Off the Webcam is a story written anonymously and uploaded to the wiki in 2012. The story starts with an unnamed narrator saying that he'd met the love of his life, a girl named Lynn, who he met while working at an event in Portland. The two lived pretty far apart, but started a relationship that day. The long distance relationship was hard, but they found ways to make it work. Lynn was living with her very traditional father, so the narrator had never actually been to her house in Washington. Eventually, she bought Lynn a webcam that she could attach to her laptop. This way, they could talk more intimately. It would help them bridge that gap until they could see each other more often once they both completed college. In 2010, Lynn's father passed away in his sleep. 
After attending his funeral in Florida, the two decided that they would finally meet at her house. She was all alone in the house now, as she'd lost both of her parents. It was just her and her dog there now. The two agreed to meet after their finals. During that week, the two were using their webcams to communicate more and more. During one late night, Lynn was telling the narrator about how her father had been acting strange the few days before he passed. He was putting up religious items and being rather watchful of her. As she's telling him this, she asks him to make her a promise. She asks him to not turn off the webcam, as having him there is the closest thing she has to family. He loved her, so he obliged. A few days later, while the two were communicating over webcam, the narrator fell asleep. He awoke a few hours later to see that Lynn was also now asleep. The laptop was in his dining room, so he left it on and slinked off to bed. He was awoken from his sleep by a phone call. It was Lynn, saying she had a nightmare. He talked to her about it and reminded her that they had a big day the next day. She laughed and reminded him not to forget something. The phone cut out as she was talking. This was normal for her since she had a garbage flip phone. The narrator tried to call a few times, but each time it would go to voicemail. Her phone really needed to be replaced. He went downstairs to grab a drink of water and saw his girlfriend and her dog staring at him through the webcam. He walked over smiling and waved at the two. She smiled back and the narrator noticed something in the background of the shot. There was some dark form in the background staring at her with malice. Two hours later, the narrator woke up on his kitchen floor. This wasn't the first time this has happened as he had blackouts when he was under heavy stress. The sight of whatever he saw must have caused one. He looked at the computer screen and saw Lynn lying face down. She didn't look up at him, but her hand reached over for her phone and started typing. The messages were being sent to him. They read, Don't turn off the webcam. Each message was sent one at a time. The narrator looked back over the laptop and saw something was crawling over towards Lynn. It stayed over her for a second before crawling towards the webcam. There was something appearing on screen. He had long, wet, stringy hair, and it seemed to be crawling through the webcam or attempting to. He ran over to the laptop, shut it closed, and threw it against the wall. He stomped on it a few times before starting to cry. He grabbed his phone and a bottle of wine and sat on the floor. His phone started to ring. It was Lynn, but he couldn't bring himself to answer it. After sitting on the floor for a while, he decided to call her back, but all he got was voicemail. The narrator woke up the next morning on his floor. He had passed out with a now empty bottle of wine in hand. He checked his phone and saw that he had one voicemail. He clicked on it and heard Lynn's terrified voice. You promised you wouldn't turn off your webcam. The narrator says that two years have passed since that night. He hasn't seen or heard from Lynn since. He's too afraid to look her up or go to see what happened to her. This is one of those stories that I remember being shared around by people that I knew. It was sent to me by a friend that knew I liked ghost stories. The way the story is told is a little slow in the beginning, with the narrator constantly mentioning how much he loves Lynn. It does take a really creepy turn, but I feel like it could have been more. The ghost trying to enter his home through the webcam is pretty unique though. Amazon Ultra is a creepypasta written and uploaded to the wiki by Stex85. The story is a man talking about a new Amazon service he was being advertised. It was called Amazon Ultra, and it came with all the perks of Amazon Prime and a few extras. More movies, more music, and faster deliveries by drone. The narrator's wife wasn't interested and thought that the drone thing was kind of weird. He told her that he'd sign her up for an account later, and she could decide then. The service was great so far, with it bringing things he was running out of, and even things he might need later. They did this by reading the data offered through the app. He also had to give up his accounts for Facebook, Twitter, and Google. The drones would fly in, give him whatever he needed, require him to click the green button on them, and then they'd fly off. They were so efficient, he was even receiving items he didn't know he needed yet. This included toothpaste, a pack of beer, and a Blu-ray for when his wife was heading out of town for a business trip. A day after the trip, he'd received an Amazon Ultra package. It was stated to be for his wife. Inside the box was a butcher's knife. Now, his wife didn't cook, so there's no way that it was for her. He pressed the return button and the drone flew away, easy as could be. Over the next couple days, he would receive weirder and weirder packages. He received rat poison, but they have no rats. He also received women's black gloves and duct tape, neither of which they needed. It was becoming more and more clear that his wife was planning to kill him when she got back. The items couldn't be delivered anywhere but the home they were assigned to. The day that his wife was set to return had arrived. He awoke that morning feeling groggy and unwell. At the foot of his bed was a drone. He looked at the box it held and saw something shiny, a barrel of a gun. 
She really was going to kill him, and after everything he'd done for her. The narrator could hear his wife's voice as she returned home. As she entered the room, he went into a fit of rage, claiming that she was seeing someone else and that she wanted to kill him. She laughed, clearly no idea what he was talking about. A hammer had been delivered from a drone and placed it in his hand. He swung at her, watching the smile on her face turn to fear as she slumped back and eventually fell through the window. She wasn't going to be able to kill him if he did it first. That's when the thought came to him. He never did get around to making her an account. A pretty dark story that was kind of cartoony at times. Like when the wife falls out of the window, two drones are just there putting down a trampoline, or the fact that the drones dropped a hammer into his hands at the perfect time for him to commit the murder. It was more like dark comedy than horror, but I liked it nonetheless. It was clear that the drones or Amazon Ultra were the ones setting up this whole thing. They wanted him to kill his wife for some reason. Sleepwatchers.net is a two-part story that was shared to the No Sleep subreddit. The story is written by Wishbone43 and tells the story of a weird website. The goal of the site is for people to be watched while they sleep, so someone can keep them company. The narrator, Oliver, starts by saying that he has just graduated high school. He is both elated and saddened. Not because high school ended, but because he was never prepared for the life that he was expected to lead after. The goal for money to sustain oneself wasn't taught to him at school. That's when he was introduced to a website called sleepwatchers.net, a website where you get paid to watch someone sleep through the night. This was done in order to keep them company and make them feel less lonely. The main clientele appeared to be older folks. Oliver's friend Manny was the one that told him about the site. The two signed up together and were ecstatic when they saw how much they made per night. After signing up, he was immediately met with a sleeper who was requesting him. Viola was her name, an older woman that had recently lost her husband. She was having a hard time sleeping discovering she had a new case of insomnia. She greeted Ollie and was happy to have him as her watcher. He was also happy to help her as he truly felt sorry for her and she was very nice. Before he began his first night of sleep watching, he was greeted with the rules of each night of work. One, do not fall asleep. Two, for no circumstances may you wake the sleeper. Three, do not touch the red emergency button unless there is an emergency. Four, do not fall asleep. It was weird they listed the first rule twice, but he didn't think much of it. It was the easiest job in the world, at least on the surface. You only had to watch the sleeper through their webcam, but you were allowed to do anything else you wanted, as long as you were watching. This meant that nights were filled with random internet searches, playing online games, and watching videos. Just as long as they didn't wake Viola, there was no issue. It appeared to be a real easy job. It had been a solid three nights of watching and a solid three nights of no issues. That was until one night, there was a change in the routine. Viola had woken up around 3 a.m. She smiled at the camera, and continued to the bathroom. Ollie looked past her bed and saw something. It looked like a long, pale hand was moving behind a curtain. As Viola returned to the room and laid back down, the hand was gone. Ollie chalked it all up to being a bit tired that night. He wasn't going to fall asleep, but he definitely needed to sleep better when he did. There was nothing weird or off about the rest of the night. A few nights after this, the incident occurred. Ollie had fallen asleep. It was for an hour or so. When he woke back up, Viola was lying in her bed. For a few minutes, it all seemed okay, until a tall figure that had bright white eyes stepped out of the darkness of the corner of the room. The figure floated over to where Viola was sleeping and loomed over her. This is when Ollie broke the second rule and yelled for Viola to wake up. She did so, and the figure immediately started punching her to death. She cried out, but nothing could be done. He continued to punch her until his fist turned from the ghostly white to a crimson red. There was nothing that Ollie could do. Even the emergency button on the site did nothing. It kept giving him an error message stating that he was locked out because he broke the rules. Now he's just to sit back and watch her die. The figure turned towards the camera and looked straight at Ollie. It's all your fault, it said. It stood there for a while. Ollie couldn't look away. He hasn't slept since that night. It's been five days since then. He is losing his mind. He just can't bring himself to sleep because he knows that it's coming for him next. This was the ending of part one of the story. It's a pretty interesting story on its own. A mysterious website that kills you for breaking the rules. Well, more like it kills the sleeper. So the person who breaks the rules kills them both. Part 2 would follow closely to the story and actually uses the original post as part of its canon events. Ollie's friend Manuel is also a watcher. He was a friend who signed up first and convinced Ollie to try out the site. Manny has his first sleeper requested to him, a war vet by the name of Dominique. The two quickly became friends as Manny would listen to all of his war stories. 
It was clear the older man had PTSD, but he still wanted to remember the war and maybe talking about it helped alleviate some of the guilt. After all this, he explains that he saw Ollie's post on Reddit. It had caught his attention since there were very few posts talking about Watchers.net. He wasn't sure what to think of the post at first. He figured that Ollie had made the whole thing up, likely from boredom. He was the type. Realizing he hadn't talked to him in some time, Manny sends him a message. A response came very quickly. All it said was, watch me. It was a strange request, but he remembered the story. Maybe he was just messing with him, but either way, he accepted his request. So starting that night, he was now watching two different sleepers at the same time. One being Dominique, the other Ollie. Dominique had told him to be wary of Ollie. It was as if he knew something, but wasn't willing to share it. The nights were progressing normally. Manny would watch Dominique first, usually by an hour, then start watching for Ollie. Ollie would always start every session by just staring into the webcam. He wouldn't say anything or respond. That was until he was about to sleep, which he would declare, and then climb into bed. This went on for a week, and with each passing day, Ollie would start to act more and more like his old self. He was even making jokes. It seemed that maybe he'd been tired this whole time. He just needed some peace of mind. Following a poor decision by Manny to stay up during the day, the night came that he would soon figure out if the story was fake or not. He had wanted to spend time with his friends, and so skipped out on sleep for one day. It wasn't the best plan, but he just wanted to enjoy a little time with his friends before they left for college. That night, as he was watching both Ollie and Dominique, he fell asleep. It wasn't for very long, maybe half an hour at most. It didn't matter. He woke up to find Ollie gone. His bed was completely empty, and the other cam feed showed that Dominique was still sleeping soundly. A grip was felt around his neck, and the voice of a former friend echoed in his ear. You fell asleep. Ollie said, but no, it didn't sound like Ollie. His grip was so strong that there was no way that he could break it. He didn't remember his friend being this strong. I had to punish you, it said. Manny was punched and everything went black immediately. Manny woke up to see Dominique's room on his monitor, and in it was Ollie. He looked different. Now a tall, lanky figure standing in the shadow of Dominique's room. He wore a smile that appeared to stretch from ear to ear. He couldn't believe it was really him, but knew that it was. He looked just like the figure described in the story. Ollie proceeded to float over to the old man's sleeping form and proceeded to punch him to death, starting with his head, then moving to the rest of his body. Manny could only watch in horror as this kind old man was beaten to death, for him breaking the rules. Manny called the police and told them about Dom's death. They took his laptop in order to find any clues about the killer's whereabouts. While doing this, they left a single policeman to watch Manny's house in case the killer came back. Even with the small semblance of safety, Manny knew that the second he fell asleep, it would all come to an end. He urges anyone reading to never go seeking out this website. Do not go to sleepwatchers.net. This was kind of a long story since it was told in two parts anyway. It definitely feels like a more complete story with both parts. The concept is another that I find myself enjoying. Webcam horror is such a small niche that I feel it hasn't been properly explored yet. There's so many possibilities and I'm excited to see what people come up with next. Stolen Laptop is a story that was posted on 4chan sometime in 2013. The story was later uploaded to the Creepypasta wiki. It's not too long of a story, but it does get across what it needs to very quickly. The story starts with a post on X. It starts, Hey X, I need some advice. I know this isn't technically paranormal, but it's creepy as hell, and I'm not sure what to do. I got a college in the northwestern United States, and a few weeks ago, during a party I was at, I stole a laptop and an iPod. I don't need to hear about how bad a person I am for stealing, yeah, I know, and that's not going to help me out now. I have occasionally stolen technology in the past to sell at pawn shops and stuff. I'm pretty good with computers, so I can usually circumvent their passwords and stuff and sell them as if they were my own. Anyway, the computer I stole had some messed up stuff on it, like some stuff that makes me feel like I stole from an actual violent and crazy person. I don't want to be too specific in case they or someone they know is on here. I'm pretty nervous about the whole thing. But my question is, does anyone know how to break into a TrueCrypt file? Is it even possible? There's one on here and I'm not even sure if I want to know what's on here after the crazy stuff I found that wasn't even password protected. OP goes on to explain that he likes to go through a person's files before deleting everything and selling the laptop. There's a bit of a thrill when it comes to seeing things you aren't meant to see. This is what he'd done with every other laptop he'd stolen or found. OP wants to go to the police, but he's worried that he'll have to explain how he got the laptop. He doesn't want this to lead back to him in any way. He's actually afraid of the person for what they'd been doing in these videos. The computer was filled with gore. A lot of it was stuff you could find online, but there were videos on it that suggested he made his own stuff too. 
there was a video of him killing an animal in self-mutilation. Needless to say, Opie didn't want this person coming after him. There's also videos that are encrypted using TrueCrypt. If these abhorrent videos were so easy for him to find, what did he find necessary to hide behind an encryption? The story ends with the OP asking for advice on the matter. He also asks if there's any way to break the encryption, though he's not sure he wants to find out what this guy bothered to encrypt. This is a story that feels like it could be true. Whether it is or isn't, well, I couldn't tell you. Something posted on 4chan over a decade ago might be hard to find any information on now, especially with how little people were archiving things back then. The story really fills you with dread as you can relate to OP. He found something he shouldn't and doesn't know what to do with the thing. Taking it to the police is always the best bet. If the video is trying to be fake, you get slapped with a fine, but if they're real, then maybe you save someone's life further down the line. There's a morbid curiosity to the videos themselves, especially whatever could be hiding behind the encryption. What depraved actions need to be encrypted when the others weren't? It's a solid mystery, but one that I'm not sure we are ever going to be ready to solve. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Blow and O's, Nora Kingsley, Icy Dice, Ryoma, Bazingal, and Hamter. Without your help, this channel wouldn't be possible. Thank you to everyone that watches my videos. We are approaching the bottom of this iceberg, and we still have so much more to see. Hope to see you all in the next video. Thank you all, and have a good night.